research. Way back when, when Mr. Silva started between 44 particularly and 53 in that time frame, although he went then to 66, as you know, he remember he was reading and researching and looking for common denominators. And he became aware of an individual by the name of Dr. Alfred Cannon. And Dr. Alfred Cannon was a, well, I don't know that he was a believer, but he was researching astral travel. I may have heard of astral travel. <laughs> so you know, those of you who haven't heard of it, it is a belief, it's a theory, purely a theory, that somehow, some way, our body can separate, or I should say, our spirit, our mind, can separate from our body and go traveling anywhere in the universe and get information. Sounds familiar? Yeah. But, be careful you don't go too far. Because if you go too far, you what? You may not come back. And they talked about a silver, S-I-L-V-E-R cord. So with due respect, this is a point I would not argue, debate, or discuss with anybody. But I can safely tell you that Mr. Silva spent probably a lifetime researching and found absolutely zero, nada, bupkis evidence to support that belief. It is purely a myth. It is purely a fear-based myth for whatever reason. And some authors may even still perpetuate that. As far as the it is. It is a fact that there is such a thing. But there is such a thing as people overdoing drugs and they have a bad experience, like LSD and hallucinogenic. There is such a thing as people who have a mental imbalance and schizophrenia or whatever, and they're hallucinating. That has nothing to do with the pureness of the experience. However, if you look at the experience, it does show us evidence of possibilities. I'll give you an example of what he did. If you look up at the board, here's the dude's name, Alfred Cannon, Astral Projection. He took three rooms in a given area where they're researching. In room number one, we'll call it number one, a male. Over here, room number three, a female. And in this room, one male, one female. Everybody here believes in astral travel, but they don't know each other, and they don't know the experimental design. So the male is asked, can you project yourself and they give him a location to the, in essence to this room? Sure, piece of cake. At the same time, a different researcher is asking the female in room number three to do the same. Sure. So both of them apparently are doing it. So now the researchers are asking to the male, are you there? Yes. Thinking if he's truly there, he should be able to what? Yeah, describe the room and what's going on. And he does, to a T, as if he's in the room describing it. Female, same thing. Whoa, isn't that kind of a knock your socks off? Yeah. Is there anything going on in the room? No. Are there people in the room? Yes. Do you know these people? No. Can you at least describe them? What's the answer? Yes. yes. And the male and the female describe the individuals in this room as if they were in the room, like you and I now, looking at each other. There was a bit of a challenge and a discrepancy, though. The male says, oh yeah, and he's describing, whoa, knock your socks off. But the male says there are two females in the room and one male. The female says there are two males in the room and one female. Who's correct? I guess you could say then that there are actually four in the room, two physically, and two more yeah. subjectively, yeah. Right. non-physically. Very repeatable experiment. These are the kinds of things. Have you ever saw the movie Ghostbusters? Mm -hmm. I like it. In my opinion, it's a pee in your pants kind of, of a movie. And I feel that way because so many of those experiments, although Hollywood, you know, sensationalizes it, all kinds of experiments they would do. So it's convincing. So Jose was that, and I wouldn't deny that. It's just that it doesn't mean that there's a separation you could go too far. It means what? Somehow, some way, we can, non-locally, without any um, think ahead, and get information. So Jose really made a conscious effort to reframe things 
and to label them in a way that would not imply, you know, would be fear based. And he calls it mental projection. So we believe human mind is a sensing faculty of human intelligence, the mind. And that somehow, way, somehow, some way, the mind, your mind, my mind, can project at a distance and get information. Kind of like mom and dad are away and projecting home to see what the kids are up to, <laughs> what the babies are up to. And by the way, I'm sure some of the moms in this room have been going, traveling, they left, you know, babysitter, and then they say, turn around, something's wrong at home. Yes? Mm -hmm. And then you go home, and there is something wrong, so they bring you, or you made a call. Yes? Hands up high. It's not uncommon. So Jose's term is mental projection. And he developed, as he was studying parapsychology, Dr. J.B. Ryan, Duke University, etc. Dr. Ryan is the guy who coined the expression, as far as I know, ESP. PSI, the 23rd letter of the Greek alphabet, was another one of his, his expressions <coughs> for that. Um, you want to hear a quick little background history? Um, I'm always in awe how Mr. Silva continued on, because you would think that J.B. Ryan would be his buddy, would be an ally, would be a colleague. Jose wrote to him, he's all excited. Remember, Jose had no academic background, no degrees, no fancy schmancy stuff. And he said, I made a startling discovery that everybody ha seems to have ESP, and it can be trained. And when they're in the alpha state, it's more likely. It, it, it does the trick. And he said, could you, we please work together? Well, Dr. Ryan wrote him a very lovely letter, very lovely, and said, dear Mr. Silva, thank you for sharing, thank you for your thoughts, thank you for you know, these ideas. But you made a big mistake. I'm not gonna come see you. You can't train somebody at ESP. You either have it or you don't. This is from the leading parapsychologist of today. And you made a big mistake. It has nothing to do with alpha. And your daughter must be a natural, and you didn't know it. And because of your work with her, it came out. I don't know. Talk about intuition. Jose giving his presentation. He used to carry the letter with him. He had it laminated in plastic. <laughs> and he would tell people the story and show the letter. He didn't do it, he's a real gentleman, but I'm sure he was thinking, uh. <laughs> Wait, you ready, want more? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Psychology Today, 1966, March issue. Dr. J.B. Ryan was a featured writer, beautiful article on ESP. And he said, I made a startling discovery. I, you can't train people to have ESP. I believe everybody has it. And when you can get them to change their brainwaves into the alpha theta state, <laughs> Almost word for word what Silva told him wow. back in the, uh, in right. the 50s. Wow. So, so Brian never went to visit, never came to see Mr. Silva or whatever like that. But the point they're making is that you would think he would have been an ally, but he just knew he had this vision. He had this vision, Jose did. So God bless the guy in doing that. So Jose put together an experiment. We'll take questions a bit for that. For lack of a better name, the famous <laughs> Timmy and Jimmy experiment. These two boys know each other. They play with each other. The two boys know the rooms they're in. Timmy's in one room, Jimmy's in another room. Timmy is asked to enter his level and maybe create something. He says, okay. Timmy, Jimmy over here, excuse me, is told, your buddy next is next door. Can you mentally project into the room? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you there, Jimmy? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Can you sense Timmy? Oh, yeah. What's he doing? Not much. He's playing. Oh, he's playing with a truck. It's red, green wheels. I think it's a fire truck. Oh. Nobody knows. Now they ask Timmy later, Timmy, have you created something altogether? Yes. Yes. What did he create? Fire truck. Fire truck. What color? Red. Red. Look out a little louder. Red. 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 <laughs> Knock your socks off, very repeatable. These are the kinds of things Mr. Silver did with his family and with neighborhood people, these experiments. And the children were even funnier, the elders, because they would pick on the youngsters, and without Jose knowing it, without Daddy knowing it, they would do all sorts of tricks on them and playing like with hypnosis and stuff. It was a lot of fun being in Laredo with the family and listening to some of these stories. 
this is, these are the things that really get started rolling with that. So if we look at this idea of mental projection, I'd like to give you a little bit of um, background, just some familiarity, <coughs> some common denominators, if you will. Do you remember remote viewing? Mm -hmm. I, I may be familiar. If not, Google it. It's a lot. Not everybody who said they were there is telling the truth, by the way. 1970s, we started that. So it's interesting. I admit, I think I've taken too much for granted in my life. And as a young guy, I met Ingo Swan. There's somebody in my virtual class who's a grad reviewing, whose buddies, was roommates with Ingo Swan in New York City in school. So whoa, what a deal. But anyway, my, my director at the time, Chris Jensen, through his contacts, knew of experiments were going on. And because of our interest in this, they, as a courtesy, we had a private meeting, instructors with Ingo Swan. We met here, of all things, in Connecticut. And Ingo Swan was a known artist. And the, the long story short is, is Dr. Harold Puttoff and Dr. Targ, who were doing work at Princeton University and others, they wanted, they felt the United States was way behind the Soviet Union during the Cold War effort, or Eastern Europe in this kind of research, which is true, by the way. If you do your research, parapsychology is not new in Eastern Europe. It's much newer in the US. In our, in our culture. So they wanted money, grants. So they put together an experimental design, hoping that they could go to the Pentagon, talk to officials, and get interest, you know, really spark interest to demonstrate the value, the, the importance of it. And they, that's how they came up with the name. I have a copy of a copy of the original research report. You ready for the name? They knew if they called it ESP, no one would listen. If they mentioned meditation, no one would listen, they'd kick them out. If they said visualization, anything even mildly like that, no one would listen. So here's what they called it. A perceptual channel for information transfer over kilometer, kilometer distances, the historical perspective and recent research. <laughs> you, you gotta laugh at that. It's brilliant, though, isn't it? A perceptual channel getting information all the distance, kilometers, is more scientific, historical perspective, recent research. Howard Puttoff and Russell Talk, uh, Puttoff, and they had an association with Institute of Electronics, Electrical Engineers, and Puttoff had some videos on YouTube. He's a senior guy like that, and if you're interested in backstory, the thing I didn't know that he talks about Ingo Swan and some of the experiments and, and some of the backstory. So here's the experimental design. Ingo Swan, to my knowledge, was one of the, if not the, very first remote viewers. Certainly pretty close to that. So they would have a group of volunteers go home. Everybody's given an identical manila envelope. So please go home and put in the envelope a photo anywhere in the world. But if you give more than one photo, it's got to be of the same local, you know, the same area. People come back with their envelopes. They're not marked in any way. Thank you very much, that's great. And then you're dismissed. So the researcher takes the pile of envelopes and brings them over here to another researcher. And now I laid eyes on you guys, I'm gone, but he never laid eyes on the volunteers. They call it, called it a double-double blind experiment in the hopes of removing the possibility of telepathy. <laughs> See, which is interesting for them to be concerned about telepathy biasing it, which is kind of like saying we believe in it. <laughs> so Ingo Swan would then grab the pile of envelopes. He does have a cue. He knows that there's photos inside of somewhere in the world. Do you have any idea what the mathematics of guesses? It's like one in millions. It's like a lottery. You got probably like a hundred billion to one chance of winning. He draws, um, this is the first one that they're shown, and he draws these lines. He says, I think it's concrete, it's bright, it's a runway. It's there, oh, there's grass, sand, and ocean all around. And then he says, over here on this side, he draws, there's an airport building or hangar. It's half moon shape, made of concrete. It has an overhang and it's casting a shadow. Five minutes to do that. 
They didn't do any kind of you know fancy. They just kind of sensed it. They opened the envelope. Two photos. One is of the landing strip, the runway, concrete. San Andreas Airport, which is an island airport off the coast of Costa Rica, surrounded by grass, sand, and ocean. On, one, on this photo, you have to read a little close, but there's an airplane in the distance, parked. He doesn't mention that. The other photo is the airport building, not half moon shaped, rectangular, concrete, overhang, casting a shadow. Oh, we could say, lucky guess. <laughs> it's an anomaly. So they did it thousands and thousands of times. <coughs> if I read correctly, it over 15,000 times. Here's the best part, though. He was known to be very creative and artist and, and intuitive. And this is how it started. They then took people off the street, so to speak. But you guys couldn't, I'm sorry, you, you, you're too open. They would take people who don't even believe in this stuff. And guess what? They never found anybody with a little bit of coaching with their protocol who couldn't do it. And of course, some did better than others. And then he told us at this meeting, he said, the next project we're working on is we've been testing getting data off of computer banks, psychically. Before digital, you know, when we had the old, the reels of tape, and the big new storage areas. And he said with some, with some degree of success. That was the last I heard of him. Now I look back and say, son of a gun, I'm from New York. Why didn't I go to coffee with him or hang out or ask him more? I just walked away and said, oh, that's cool. And I had to copy him and further. Although this was done in the 70s, science says anything before 1992 they won't accept. But it's the most complete, it's the most tested. I don't know anybody who could punch holes in this in doing that. And then it went underground, as you know, and the Pentagon took it over, and they were working on weaponizing it. And uh, I'm not going to use his name, but a man who used to be my director realized when it was, um, what do you call it, um, declassified, that he was inadvertently participating. Because of his connection, they were sending out to large groups of people small pieces for the remote viewing experiment in an envelope, and then you would do your thing and $50 bill for your trouble and send it back to a P.O. box. And what they were doing was looking for the missile sites, the movable Soviet missile sites on the trucks mm -hmm. and things. So the men who talked to goats, you can get that movie probably on Netflix. It's, it's another pee in your pants movie. <laughs> they were really testing to see. Remember what Alex said? He said about his energy? They were testing to see, could they, and they tested them on goats. Could they, with their energy, you know, move them? Thinking Seriously. they'd have a super soldier who could make the enemy fall over or something. Really. No, they wanted to kill. Yeah, I'm not even going to go there. I'm not even going to go there. You ever seen Inception? So 20 years, yes, yes. So 20 years of that. And then now they let it go. I'm told they said that they're no longer doing it because they don't see value in the research. Lies. <coughs> Sorry. I beg your pardon. I apologize. <coughs> so why do I bring this up to you? I bring it up because it's about the possibility. I mean, we could go on and on. This is not new stuff. This is not exclusive to the civil organization, although we are the most copied, most imitated program probably on this planet. And Mr. Silver was way ahead, but un understandably, and admittedly, he didn't always have the, the exact science or the language. And I, I really wish he were alive, because so much of what he was proposing, now science is backing up. So these are just some of the terms. Another one is intuition, ESP, whatever. So again, may I remind you, the key is we need, we need what? Reference points. Reference points. We need to learn how to interpret what we're feeling, what we're sensing, and that takes practice. You'll have lots of practice this weekend. However, may I remind you, it, 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 it doesn't stop there. It's the type of thing that, like any skill, like any skill. Some of you have been very complimentary to me about my energy or my knowledge. It's training, you know, and practice and, and working with that. I didn't just 
poof, you know, out of, out of thin air with respect to that. So we're going to do lots of practicing with this. I went to the dictionary, though. I was, and you need feedback. So again, the feedback you're going to get is what's called deliberate practice. Just like this morning, you got immediate feedback from your partner whether you were correct or not. So I went to the dictionary. I was curious. I was surprised. It actually is defined in the dictionary. Everybody, read it out loud. Spontaneous phenomenon, which cannot be contrived or forced, the act or faculty of knowing correctly without the use of the rational process. <laughs> when you agree, that's a very, that's an excellent, pretty good definition of it. So, Three exercises, mental projection. Exercise number one, we call affectionately the home exercise. And allow me to explain. We take a quick peek here at the uh, chart. The, let's see. Whoops. A lot of, oh my God, we covered a lot of ground. I gotta find my way here though. Wait a bit. Ah. Okay, so let's call this a chart of dimensions. So we know we're multidimensional, agreed? Yes. Can you see that? Physically we have senses to sense, get information about what we're experiencing, but we also have, I prefer to say subjective senses, non-physical, with that. And the brain serves as a link. So obviously we can say, I can feel it, it's Clear as can be, I can see it as clear as day. I can touch this; it's solid, you know. But subjectively, we don't have it, 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 it's not quote as, as real, so to speak. So we imagine, right? And sometimes we're correct. Sometimes so the very we're first not. exercise serves still making purpose. impressions on the brain. You have been in your home how many times? <laughs> A lot. Agree? Mm -hmm. So you're very familiar. Remember we talked about imagination and visualization. Yeah. If I say now, hey. Remember your home, what it looks like? Of course. So we're gonna start with that in the exercise. So while we're at level, these exercises now are really dynamic meditation, even more so. Very little time getting into level, most of our time spent doing something. So while you're at level, eyes closed, up, let's see this, we count. I'll count to three, and at the count to three, I'll ask you, now imagine you're standing about 30 feet away from your home or the building where your home is. And just remember what it looks like, its size, color, shape. Can you do that? Yes. So imagine you're like 30 feet away from it and you're studying the roof, what it looks like, even if you've never seen the roof. Colors, especially colors. It's like reading a page of a book, going left to right. And you hear me say, take your time, study color. No biggie, right? You're remembering things that you've done, only now you're consciously registering it and stopping to study something that maybe stands out. Then I'll say, move up close to the front door, operate the front door to your home, and enter your home, close the door behind you, and go into the living room. No deep significance to the living room, other than it's a familiar place, it's friendly, we're working with the group, and you'll hear me use that term. So, Stand in the center of your living room, and guess which wall you're gonna face? South wall, <laughs> And while you're, and again, we'll come back later and explain. While you're facing the living room south wall, you've been there before. You know what's in the room, agree? Yes. You've been there nighttime, lights on or off. You still know what's there, I'm sensing. And we'll make believe. You'll imagine as if you're there in these different scenarios, which is a lot of it remembering past experience. These exercises are great to help you improve visualization, to help you cultivate your imagination, to enhance your making believe concepts so you can be better at your manifestation skills, I'm sorry, like mirror the mind. Then, why, oh, by the way, your south wall, usually midday the sun is coming up, facing the south, there might be a lot of windows there, or that's okay. If you make a mistake, that's okay too. Imagine, and you hear me say, you've got to, now we start doing a little different. A painter with a brush or a roller and finishing painting up the wall all black. Your south wall in your living room is now black. 
Mind you, what do I look like? We do the same thing, a chart, black to red to green and to blue, and then violet. It's a color meditation. We're literally going from the colors that give off the least amount of energy, a little more energy, a little bit more, to the most active or the most energetic. No deep significance, it's just, how we put it, corresponding in the sense of the chart. Then, uh, and not looking for anything, just to get an impression, great. And I'm gonna roll right through this. I'm not gonna go slow and say, now I sense it. Intuition is quick. It's part of the training. First impression. If you don't get an impression, that's okay. And now I say, move up close to the wall. Everybody, extend your arm. As if you're touching the living room south wall. It feels kind of goofy, doesn't it? There's nothing there but air. This is meant by enhancing and making believe concept. It'll help keep you awake. It'll help keep you focused. So if somebody even asked about drifting, this, these are ways because you're a little bit more objectively involved. Is the wall smooth or rough? Is it warm or cold? Again, you've touched the wall more than a few times. If there's a lot of glass there, find a section where there's wall or a nearby corner where there's some wall, okay? And one more step. And then at the count of three, are you ready? Now some of you know, count to three, imagine projecting yourself inside your living room south wall. One, two, three. Doesn't that sound freaking ridiculous? Logically, what is this? Beam them up, Scotty? Yeah. You know, dematerializing and materializing? <clears throat> so what would it be like if you could actually attune as if you were inside, not on the other side, inside the wall? What if you were small enough to fit? What if the wall was big enough to fit you? What would it be like? So we're gonna use four common denominators. Is there any light inside the wall and how does it compare with when you're in the room? Is there any temperature difference? Lighting difference? Uh, odor? And then I'll say objectively, this is your cue. Please, count to three, objectively extend your arm and knock on the wall. Oh, one, two, three. Not on your neighbor's back. <laughs> How solid would you judge a material to be? So let me just play with you this. From a logical point of view, objectively, what has he been smoking? Really? I mean, really, from a logical point of view, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I agree. That's the beauty of it. Intuition does not follow the same laws of objective communication and objective reality. You're doing this purely subjectively. You are in your thoughts. You are projecting your mind. And if you did, what would it be like? What do you see what the experience was like? And then we come out. Then the center, change of the colors of the wall. And then we're going to do, uh, take a chair, any chair, favorite chair. And imagine taking the chair, you ready? Everybody, grab the chair. And you're placing it up about the angle where your mental screen would be, and it will stay in that position, and I'm going, nice chair. Look like you're posing. And it will stay, it will stay in that position, and I'm going, put your hands to rest. How does the chair stand out against the colors of the wall as we change it? And then we'll do the same thing, with a watermelon, imagine the inside of the watermelon, the skin, the odor, the taste, an orange, a lemon, three bananas, three carrots, and a fresh and crisp head of lettuce for a little salad, you know, a little snack. You notice they're colorful things, they're things that we're very familiar with. So we're working with first familiar, bridging the gap into doing something subjectively where initially we don't have as much familiarity. So it's a good you know, wall-up exercise. Then um, we're back out. You'll hear me say, when, uh, every time you function at this dimension of mind, you receive beneficial effect, beneficial effect. Whatever you perceive at this dimension of mind, you can use as points of reference. So right now, the exercise specifically, the only real point of reference consciously you'll have is what's working for you. Where are you flowing? So is it a sense of knowing for you? Is it a visual pattern? Is it feeling? We're kind of evaluating, looking for where we're flowing. 
So there's no feedback I can give you. And it doesn't matter whether you've ever seen the inside of the wall or not. So what we're doing is cultivating the skill set, the aspects of our being that help us to do this. And then tonight, like I said, if there's the three exercises, we'll do a psychometry, and then tomorrow a little more practice, and then some more working where you get immediate feedback. We'll use the alpha sound one more, and then after that we'll start using the theta sound. You okay? Mm -hmm. So can we take a very short pause, and then we'll come back? So how about seven minutes, and then we'll come back and do